Hello friends and welcome to Mythological African Steep Dives episode 11 and this time we will be talking about intersexuality. When I was born with an atypical body anatomy close to 40 years ago, my peasant mother did not know how to handle the situation because there was simply no space to dialogue on an issue such as that one. It was not popular and therefore not normal for a woman to give birth to a child that could not be clearly classified as male or female. She mitigated my and her own trauma the best way she knew how, and that was to find a mystical interpretation for it. There were concerns about whether I would ever have normal sexual relationships, whether I would ever marry just like a normal person, whether I would be able to have children just like a normal person, and whether I would be able to develop mentally and intellectually just like a normal person. The situation was vexing and, with some nod from an explanation handed down by family ancestral spirits, a decision was quickly reached to classify me as a girl because it was considered an easy agenda to control or manipulate. Given the absence of appropriate medical and psychosocial support at the time, I believe that my parents took what appeared to them as the best course of action to contain a situation that placed huge questions not only on my sexuality and identity, but on their own as well. The struggle to try to be a girl was harrowing. I did everything a girl should not do socially, and occasional rebuking was not effective. From a very early age, I did not expose my nakedness or engage in communal games or festivities because my mother instilled in me strong inhibitions towards these. This could have contributed to why I became an introvert and never developed a love for sports. Nonetheless, I discovered that I was different from as early as primary six when I had the chance to clearly see other girls naked performing a Kiganda female sexuality ritual. I was blessed because both my parents encouraged me to talk to them about my experiences and my mother gave me a satisfactory explanation for my difference. My father was mostly absent, therefore the weight of my condition lay more on my mother than on him and she paid a great price to maintain the silence while ensuring that I lived as normally as possible. The climax of my struggle happened during puberty when, in an all-girls boarding school, I failed to fulfill age-old female sexuality milestones such as menstruation and sexual attraction to the opposite sex. Although I had negligible breast development, I grew unsightly body hair on my face, legs and arms. The most alarming of all was the progressive development of male genitalia and consequent attraction to some girls I associated with. When I was old enough to fully understand my situation, I also learned that there was a God who had created me and that he was most powerful, able to do or change anything. I latched onto this new relieving belief and sought a prayer-based solution to my sexuality predicament. While I still believe in the supremacy and omnipotence of God and I still strongly subscribe to prayer, I realized that back then my belief was premised on the false conviction that I was abnormal haunted by generational curses, with a questionable future and in need of divine deliverance from the sins of my ancestors. I had no idea that my sexuality was simply a diversion from what was popular and furthermore, that it happened more often than acknowledged. At 20 years old, I realized that I had the power of choice over my sexuality and I decided to tell someone. A series of events followed, which included sexual and spiritual counseling. After two years of counseling, I knew that despite the social stigma that lay ahead of me, I simply could not keep up the female image. In my case, the challenges of being either a woman or a man were equal. But what was most important and delightful was that by letting go of the female image, I would never get romantic advances from a man. I would never be forced to find some man to marry me, and I would not have to conceal my sexual feelings for girls. I decided, after much, much soul-searching, that with those thorny issues out of the picture, I was ready to leave out the other challenging realities of having been born intersex. I stopped the pills. I stopped the traditional medicines. I stopped the deliverance prayers. I took off the skirts. 
sought medical intervention and became a man. Jules Kagwa is one of many intersex people on the African continent, hundreds of thousands. And quite often their experiences are characterized by ignorance of what it means to be intersex, stigmatizing attitudes often based on traditional and religious beliefs, and violence, especially sexual violence. And what this results in is that being intersex is shrouded in shame and secrecy. But this doesn't have to be the case. For today's discussion, we will start by looking at what it means to be intersex. And then we will look at that term hermaphrodite, which has been used previously in medical literature to describe individuals who are intersex. And we'll look at some of the issues associated with that term. We'll also look at some intersex statistics, so to get a sense of how many intersex people there are really in the world. And then we'll examine very briefly the occurrence of um, intersexuality in world mythology and folklore with some specific examples. And then we'll shift our focus to the African continent and take a look at some Africans who are intersex, and this will include activists, Olympians, beauty queens, and others. We'll also look at the occurrence of intersexuality in African mythology and folklore, and we'll have one case study. So this will include the culture-specific terms and what that means for individuals who are born intersex in these communities. And then we'll look at the social reality of intersex people across the African continent, and then look at some of the ongoing movements for protections that are being pushed for for intersex people. So what does it mean to be intersex? Simple answer, intersex people are individuals born with sexual characteristics, so gonads, genitals, chromosomes, that don't fit the typical binary notions of male or female. You might have noticed I said simple answer because there is a lot more to being intersex than having atypical sexual characteristics. There is a broad range of expressions, both at the external level, so what shows up outside, but also for internal reproductive organs all the way down to the chromosomal level. And so the medical community has come up with a variety of terms to describe the various states of being intersex. But what it boils down to is that some intersex traits are visible at birth while others are not apparent onto puberty. And you can imagine this can be very challenging for people. Also, some people do not really present physically as intersex, but they do present that way at the chromosomal level. And this might present um, issues with um, having children, etc. And that's when people usually find out. So again, can be very distressing. It is important to note, though, that being intersex has really to do with biological sexual characteristics. It has nothing to do with a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. And what this means is that an intersex person may be straight, may be gay, may be lesbian, bisexual, asexual, and they might identify as male, female, both, or neither. You may have heard the term hermaphrodite used to refer to intersex people. So let's take some time to look at why that term is no longer appropriate. The term hermaphrodite is derived from the Greek god Hermaphroditus. We'll talk about him later. It was first used for human beings by Theodore Albert Edwin Klebs, who is a German-Swiss microbiologist. And he used this term as a simple way to explain these differences in sexual characteristics in human beings. But what's interesting to note here is that at that time, it was based simply on observable differences. Nowadays, hermaphrodite is an outdated term for describing intersex people. Hermaphrodite implies that a person is both fully male and fully female, and this is not possible. It's usually used now to describe biological organisms which have male and female reproductive organs and can produce male and female reproductive cells that will successfully become you know, new organisms. So its use in humans is considered scientifically inaccurate and offensive. And if you want to get a better idea of why this is so, there's a really great paper on this topic put forward by um, pediatric endocrinologist, which um, makes a really strong case for changing the name uh, from hermaphrodite to intersex. And this paper was written way back in 2005. So this is something that is well established in the medical community. And the crux of their argument is that this term was designed to clear up social problems caused by sexual ambiguity um, so that 
that it would be easy to separate who was male from who was female. And it had not so much to do with the, the patient's well-being, with the individual's well-being. It was a way to make people who were not intersex comfortable. And as you can imagine, if your experience is defined in a way that is designed to make other people com uh, comfortable, it can be very challenging and stigmatizing for you as the person. Experts estimate that up to 1.7% of the human population is intersex. Now, 1.7 might seem like a small number, but when you apply it to the total human population of 8 billion, that comes up to over 100 million people. That is a lot of people. On the African continent, in Kenya alone, for example, it's estimated that about 700,000 people are intersex. And again, that's a lot of people to be living in shame and fear, especially since, as we're about to find out, being intersex is nothing new to the human experience. Hermaphroditus is an ancient Greek god of intersexuality, effeminacy, and androgyny. He is the son of Hermes, the messenger god, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love, lust, beauty, pleasure, passion, and procreation. His name is a composite of Hermes and Aphrodite. Hermaphroditus was born a remarkably handsome boy whom a naiad, a water spirit, called Salmachus, attempted to rape and so desired so strongly that a god in answer to her prayer merged their two forms into one. Adhanarishvara is a Hindu deity who is a composite of Shiva and Shakti, who are two major Hindu deities associated with primordial creative power. In their story, Shakti asked Shiva to be a part of him in body and mind, and he used his divine powers to grant her wish. So he absorbed her into himself and created this half-man, half-woman aspect, um, which symbolizes the oneness of all beings. And so Adhanarishvara is a major deity venerated by transgender, intersex, and other third-gender Hindu people. In Jewish traditions, the term androgynous refers to people who possess both male and female sexual characteristics. Matter of fact, in Jewish sacred texts, they are described as people who present as both male and female, in some ways like men, in some ways like women, in some ways like both men and women, and in other ways like neither men nor women. According to some Jewish scholars, the first being God created was androgynous, one side male and one side female. And so when God took Adam's rib to create Eve, he actually took one side of this androgynous being's body because the phrase used to describe Eve's creation from Adam's rib is similar to the phrase used in the book of Exodus to refer to one side of the holy tabernacle. Deities whose physical form and imagery merge male and female characteristics occur all over the world and they are usually associated with creation and fertility. But one must be careful not to immediately make the association of them with intersexuality because it might be that in the context out of which those deities come, they are associated with things other than intersexuality. Let's shift our gears now to the African continent where we will look at who the intersex people are on the African continent, what myths and folklore might exist on the African continent about intersexuality, and most importantly, what does that mean for intersex people on the continent? In these pictures, we have an Olympic athlete, a beauty queen, and a couple of regular people who have three things in common. They are African, they're intersex, and they are activists. These people have taken on the activist role mainly because they were thrust into the spotlight due to some discriminatory event that had to do with them being intersex. One thing to keep in mind that there are a lot more people who are operating under the radar, bearing a heavy burden of silence and shame because they don't have anyone to really advocate for them in their communities as intersex people. What do African myths and folklore have to say about intersexuality? There are many androgynous deities in African mythology and folklore. Some familiar ones include Nana Bukulu and Maulisa from the Fawni people who are found in Benin. There is also Mwari, who is of the Shona people found in Zimbabwe. And there is Olukun of the Yoruba people found in Nigeria and other West African countries. And these deities have male and female aspects, they are androgynous. And so quite often they are linked to intersexuality and being transgender. 
But as we've talked about before, we have to be careful about linking androgynous deities to intersexuality because they are not always associated with intersexuality. And in some cases, if they are associated with intersexuality, this doesn't always translate into a positive lived experience for intersex people. Our case study for intersexuality in African mythology and folklore comes from the Bambara of Mali. It is from the Bambara creation narrative that social values, attitudes, and practices concerning intersex individuals are derived. The Bambara creation myth starts with a naked earth and the supreme being manifesting as a grain known as Pemba. A balanza tree grew from this seed, and a balanza is Acacia albida. It grew from this seed, and when it became fully grown, it withered and fell to the ground. It rotted away, and eventually all that remained was a long beam of wood known as Pembele. This beam of wood secreted mildew, which accumulated beneath it, and eventually mixed with Pembele saliva to create a new being, a female known as Muso Koroni Kondae. This means little old woman with the white head. And so Muso Koroni started creating life on earth, plants, animals, human beings. But her process was characterized by disorder, confusion, and haste because she wanted to populate the earth as fast as possible. Eventually, she planted the pembele, the beam of wood, in the ground, and it grew into a tree which humans worshipped. And then eventually, Pemba created Pharaoh, another supernatural being who represents order and equilibrium. In some versions of the story, at this point, Musukoroni disappears after spending a rich life on Earth causing disorder and chaos. In others, she continues to live as a personification of air, wind, and fire, and as Nyale, the mother of magic and the first sorceress. The Bambara believe that Nyale represents energy, activity, and desire. Nyale is extravagant, unruly, uncontrolled, excessive, and causes all creation to proliferate, but in an uncontrolled manner. The hasty nature of her creative efforts is what resulted in what the Bambara consider defective beings. It is also believed that Mosokoroni was originally created with a soul that had two parts, a me and a dear. And this is what happens for all human beings in the Bambara worldview except people inherit these parts from recently deceased relatives. At the time of her creation, Pemba gave Musokoroni her knee, but gave the dia, the double of her soul, to Faru, and he did this to set a limit on the amount of disorder that could be in the world as a result of Musokoroni's actions. Faru, who represents order and equilibrium, is believed to be androgynous, and is often depicted with long black hair, breasts, a white fish-like or reptilian body. Pharaoh's right hand is male, and Pharaoh's left hand is female. Pharaoh has no external genitalia, but self-impregnated and gave birth to female twins when water first flowed on the earth. Thus, Pharaoh is the author of twinning, and also the original intersex individual in the Bambara worldview. So Bambara people associate intersex individuals with Faru, and they believe that Faru gives them their knee and their dia, so the components of their soul. But does this translate into real privileges for intersex people in Bambara society, especially those who present with atypical genital anatomy? It doesn't. Why is this? Well, first, because of their atypical genital anatomy, they cannot undergo male or female circumcision rites through which children become full-fledged members of society. And keep in mind that in Bambara and many traditional West African societies, these rites of passage are absolutely necessary to the extent that among some people, a child is not a full human being until they go through these rites of passage. Being uncircumcised as a result of being intersex is also associated with having a dominant wazo. What is wazo? Wazo is a powerful but negative spiritual force which encompasses ignorance and separation from higher intellectual planes. It is associated with musokoroni. The positive element is called tere, and it's comprised of conscience and character, and it reflects Bemba, the creator. And so in traditional Bambara belief, in addition to a ni and a dia, which each living being possesses, they also have a tere and a wazo, which are joined together so that the tere, the positive force, controls wazo, the negative force. And it is through circumcision that the wazo is released. 
And so it is believed that intersex individuals, as well as albinos, by the way, do not have their tere and their wazoo joined together. And so their wazoo exerts a greater influence on these individuals. And since it is through circumcision that wazoo is released, intersex individuals retain their wazoo and as a result, they can never access spiritual knowledge required to become full-fledged responsible adult members of society. As you can imagine, this puts them in a permanent paria position in Bambara society. It's not only amongst the Bambara that being intersex comes with significant amounts of social stigma. It is the case in many communities across the African continent and for various reasons, social, religious, and more. Quite often, individuals who are born intersex are killed at birth there is a high rate of infanticide associated with, with being intersex and um, in some communities there is the euphemism called break the sweet potato which is used to refer to the process of midwives killing intersex babies at birth which is horrifying to think about. In other cases being intersex is shrouded in so much secrecy it is literally impossible for these individuals to have full healthy psychological and emotional lives and so there is a high suicide rate associated with being intersex in communities where it is important that you get married and start having children as you can imagine being intersex is just a very difficult position to be in because you cannot do those things and that in and of itself is stigmatizing and by the time people find out why it's stigmatizing even more so just across the board there is a lot of pain and difficulty and shame associated with being intersex and this doesn't have to be the case a lot of work remains to be done as far as intersexuality is concerned on the african continent currently only four countries Kenya, Namibia, South Africa, and Uganda have any laws which explicitly offer intersex individuals some protection. Intersex and other human rights activists are rallying to the cause. In November 2017, the first African intersex meeting, which involved 22 intersex people representing organizations from seven African countries, took place in Johannesburg, South Africa. And this gathering has grown into the African intersex movement, whose aims center around organizing to ensure legal protections and appropriate care and consideration for intersex people. What people believe about who they are and their place in the world, especially as expressed in their mythology and folklore, can have very serious implications as we've just seen. This is why I do Mythological Africans as a way to understand African worldviews and hopefully address some of the difficult challenges that we have in our communities. If you enjoyed the video today, please take some time to like and share with your friends. Also subscribe to the channel. And let me know in the comments um, what the beliefs are from your part of the world. And if you are an intersex person on the African continent, please know that you are not alone. You have people who see you, people who care, and organizations that are willing to help. I will put in the comments and in the descriptions as many organizations as I can find that provide support for intersex individuals.